Hello, my name is Rob McBean, and I'll be the presenter for tonight's Socialist Action webcast, Keep Your Rent, Tenants' Rights in the Age of COVID-19. I am an essential worker in a grocery store and a member of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 1006A. I'm a member of the East York, Ontario branch of the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, or just ACORN for short. I'm also a member of the Toronto branch of Socialist Action. I'm joined for today's webcast today by Ellen Ramsey, a Socialist Action member and housing activist in Vancouver. I'm also joined by Eurydice Baumgarten, who works for the Federation of Metro Tenants Organizations in Toronto, and finally by Peter de Gama, also an ACORN member, who was the Socialist Action candidate for Toronto City Council in Etobicoke North in 2018. Uh, my presentation will hopefully last about 20 minutes, after which the panelists will comment, will comment and they are free to ask questions. Uh, they can speak for between two and five minutes each time. Uh, after I respond to the best of my ability, we will go to questions from the audience online. Audience members can submit their questions uh, directly from YouTube by typing their question right into the chat column. We welcome all your questions. The panelists and myself will do our best to answer them. If you like this webcast, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. If you agree with what you hear during this program, please join Socialist Action by signing up on our website www.socialistaction.ca and by calling 647-986-1917. Let's begin. Paying rent sucks. In Toronto, where me and two of the other panelists live, we are living in the second most expensive real estate market in the entire world. Ellen, who is joining us from Vancouver, is in the exact same boat as us, as housing prices are exorbitantly high there as well. In Toronto, the average monthly rent for a new person moving into a standard one bedroom apartment was nearly $2,300 per month before the pandemic. So understandably, the idea of keeping our rent is very tantalizing to say the least. But what does that entail? What happens when you stop paying rent? First off, uh, let me say to anyone who's thinking about uh, just all by themselves, just deciding that they're going to keep their rent just because they want to, is going to have a bad time. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's no hope and that everybody is going to be a slave to their landlord forever. There is a tactic which can work, and that tactic is called the rent strike. It's not easy and it needs to be done right, but it can and does work. Tonight, we're gonna to look at some different real world cases of rent strikes right here in Toronto. Uh, we'll see what works, what doesn't, uh, and why it doesn't work or why it does work, and if you can actually keep your rent. Now, before we look at the case studies, first, I want to give an understanding of how Toronto uh, became the second worst housing market, by worst I mean most expensive, on planet Earth. A long time ago, in 1989, Toronto was in a similar situation of being in an expensive housing crisis. Prices were inflated so high that working class people and first time home buyers were priced out of the market. Now, one feature of capitalist markets that will never change is that every boom is always followed by a bust. The crash came in 1990 and sent prices spiraling down until 1996. In 1996, the same detached houses that today cost over $1.3 million before COVID uh, you could get those houses for $300,000. And that figure is adjusted for inflation. So that's 300K in our money of our time, not in 1996 dollars. 
So what that means is that the price for housing has more than quadrupled over 24 years. So is that house actually four times better than it was in 1996? Absolutely not. It's probably worse now since it's older and requires more maintenance. This ridiculous increase in the price of housing is solely because of the speculative capitalist real estate market. Prices for Toronto real estate began rising noticeably in 2009. The first stage of Toronto's housing crisis was from 2009 to 2015. Prices for a detached home went from $500,000 to $800,000 over those six years. Stage two of the crisis went from 2015 and lasted until mid-2017. Uh, this was the turbo crisis, uh, where house prices jumped from 800K to 1.36 million in just two and a half years. So in response to this, uh, in 2017, the government introduced some reforms to try to curb this market. They made it harder to get a mortgage and they added some punitive clauses against foreign buyers and speculators who were buying real estate strictly as investments, not as a place to live. At first, uh, this did have the intended effect of reducing prices by a good chunk and it lasted about a year. But this was no economic crisis. This was no bubble bursting. Instead of a market going bust, it was just government reform. As with all reforms of capitalism, whatever benefits were won were worn away very quickly by the powerful forces of the capitalist market itself. It was also though in 2017 that we started to see the fight back by those of us who are victimized by the housing crisis. We started to get wise to the landlord's tricks and their tactics, their so-called rent evictions and own use evictions, where the owner makes up some story about they're gonna fix up the property or they need it for themselves or their family, when really they're just trying to get you out the door to get a new tenant in who they can charge more rent. Even better, that's when we started to see rent strikes there were two successful rent strikes against giant landlords, Metcap Living and Nuspoor Investments, uh, both led by an organization called Parkdale Organizing, who are currently leading today's Keep Your Rent campaign. Now, we're going to look in detail at those strikes in a little bit. Despite the government reforms and the first signs of fight back, by 2019, housing prices were right back where they were before. They were on track to keep going up and up and up. There was no end in sight. Going into March of this year was when we saw that peak statistic. The detached Toronto home was selling for $1.36 million. Our Toronto real estate market had once again become a cesspool of speculation. You would see homeless people on every corner while 66,000 houses in the city of Toronto sat empty so their investor owners could watch them appreciate in value. 40% of all the condominiums in Toronto were not lived in by the person who owned them. Instead, the investor owners opted to keep them as apartment condos sublets, just empty, or the mother of all expensive housing, Airbnbs. But then, COVID. First, Airbnb was decimated. Even before the lockdown, cancellations were the norm. Uh, units operating at 100% capacity turned into 100% cancellations. In Canada, the first real estate market to feel a chill was Vancouver when the Asian investors began to stay home and keep their money with them 
instead of visiting to do house and condo purchases. Shortly after, open house showings were stopped. In Toronto and Vancouver, the real estate market had been mostly cancelled. The number of properties transacting on the market nosedived. Nearly 70% of people who would have bought or sold real estate just didn't do it during the lockdown. Two days after the lockdown hit, Ontario stopped all residential eviction hearings and stopped enforcement of existing eviction orders. Non-payment of rent was, and currently is, not a valid reason to be evicted from your home. Today, only a tiny number of evictions are currently allowed, and the circumstances must be extreme. Right after that, the first calls to keep your rent began being heard. And people are keeping their rent to some extent. In a typical month before COVID, landlords were collecting about 90% of the money that they charge for their monthly rents. In April of May of this year, since COVID, they have been collecting about 80%. Now, this drop is consistent with the drop in actual property values in Toronto, uh, which have lost about 11% of their value. So uh, the investor owner who was living somewhere else or all by themselves in their $1.36 million home uh, has now lost about $150,000 in two months. Rent prices uh, are not quite there yet. Uh, rent has only dropped about 2.7%, but more reductions are certain if this pandemic continues. So now we know where we are and how we got here. But more importantly, how can we keep our rent? I'm gonna look at some different case studies and their outcomes. Uh, one of them is hypothetical, but the rest are all real world examples. Uh, my hypothetical example is a demonstration of uh, how not to keep your rent. Do not, under any circumstances, just stop paying your rent all by yourself so that you can stick it to your landlord and say, ha ha ha, you can't evict me right now. Come and get me, I dare you. Uh, you will be evicted after the pandemic. And there is no telling what kind of nasty business and tricks your landlord is going to pull against you in the months or maybe even perhaps in the years before your eventual eviction comes. Um, but if you truly cannot pay your, cannot pay your rent, that's another story. Uh, it's not an ideal situation for you or your landlord, but do not starve yourself or go without medicine uh, or food or, or pet food. Don't cancel your phone or internet service just so you can hand every nickel and dime you have to your name over to your landlord. Uh, the pause in evictions that we're enjoying right now has been designed to help you. So by all means, keep as much of your rent as you need to. You will need to communicate with your landlord uh, and explain your situation, why you can't pay and what your plans are to keep in your housing, to stay in your housing as things get back to normal. So as you can see, um, acting individually and just keeping your rent as an individual uh, does not have the greatest outcome. But there is another level. The next level of keeping our rent is called the rent strike. A rent strike is not an individual action. It is a planned, conscious, collective decision among tenants to withhold their rent. It is accompanied by demands which are put on to the landlord. In order to get the tenants to start paying rent again, the landlord must agree to meet certain demands. No concessions from the landlord, no rent from the tenants. Now, that's really easy for me to say, and it's very, very hard to do successfully in the real world but it has been done. And we're gonna look at two successful rent strikes right now. Uh, they were both in Parkdale and had institutional backing. Uh, the organization that facilitated it was called Parkdale Organize. And they can be reached at their website, which is keepyourrent.com slash home. The first strike, which we'll look at in detail, uh, was against Metcap Living. Metcap Living, Parkdale's 
biggest landlord with more than 20 apartment buildings was accused of starving out tenants in 2017 by ignoring their maintenance requests and letting their units go to heck. At the same time, they were doing cosmetic improvements to outside parts of the building to make it look prettier to the outside world. They were using this as justification for issuing heavy rent increases well above the guidelines established by the government. They wanted to drive out long-term tenants who were paying low rent and get new tenants who they could charge more. 2018 rents on units in Metcap buildings were said to often be double those paid by the previous tenants. Metcap president Brent Merrill got up to some tricks in the media, telling journalists that he had made every effort to, ma to manage maintenance requests, including setting up a tenant hotline, so on and so forth. But the tenants who had to live there, they knew better. And they pushed back with a rent strike that was spread across, across 12 Metcap buildings in Parkdale. 300 tenants consciously decided to withhold their rent with a series of demands for the landlord to go with it. <clears throat> they wanted an end to exorbitant rent increases. They wanted proper maintenance of the building and rent relief for tenants in difficulty. Those were the demands. And this strike got hot. The aforementioned president, Brent Merrill, actually tried to run over a rent striker with his pickup truck in one confrontation. And this is on video. You can see it on YouTube. Once again, Merrill spun his story in the mainstream media by saying, oh, he was rescuing a terrified property manager from an angry mob. Now, this strike stretched out over two months and ended in victory. The tenants won. The company agreed to go back to small rent increases, which are no higher than the government guidelines. They followed up with maintenance repair work in buildings. Additionally, rent relief was granted to some tenants who were struggling financially. The other Parkdale strike was almost identical. Same neighborhood, same tactics, similar demands, identical time frame, same outcome. Victory. The property management company reduced their rent increases to the regular government allowed amount. There was another rent strike in Flemington Park, which was not so successful. A tribunal, this was in 2018, a tribunal called the Landlord and Tenant Board ordered the tenants to pay all the months of skipped rent payments back to the landlord or risk being evicted at a hearing. From my vantage point, it seems that the error that may have been made by those rent strikers is that they were relying on the capitalist state to help them. Their actions seem to be mostly centered around winning the hearing at the landlord tenant board. The actual strike action itself was secondary to trying to win this board hearing. The Ontario Landlord and Tenant Board, or LTB for short, is kind of a snake pit. It's got a lot of liberal careerists. Probably many of them are property owners themselves. The Landlord-Tenant Board is, above all else, committed to preserving the private property and their rights of people rich enough to own it. The LTB is not something that tenants should rely on for help. A successful strike relies on the unity of the strikers and our will to see the strike through to the end. Despite the guaranteed difficulty, adversity, and attacks. And that brings us up to today. Right now, as we speak, Parkdale Organize is providing the framework for a much larger rent strike, including all tenants in the COVID era. Will it be successful? That remains to be seen. The demands are good, namely, no demands for rent or threats of eviction during the COVID crisis. Uh, another demand is that relief money is not rent money. Keep your CERB. CERB being the relief payment that some workers in Canada qualify for. The tactics seem good as well. Recently, tenants have gotten together to uh, pay a visit to the mansions of their rich landlords to personally deliver their demands. This kind of militancy does work, but it's not easy. It gets hot and it can get messy. 
the cops were called on protesters during their mansion visits. If the people who today are keeping their rent are not just ordered to simply pay it all back after COVID or face eviction, then this movement will have been a huge success. It's too early to say whether or not that's going to happen. What we can say with certainty is that if we do get to keep our rent, it will be solely because of our militant, united, organized strike action. Thanks. That's all for me for now. <clears throat> Kurt, you there? Yes, I am here. <laughs> so uh, I was saying that, uh, Rob, you're the host. You're supposed to be hosting. Oh, okay. All right. So next, uh, we're going to go. Uh, to Eurydice Baumgarten, uh, who um, uh, works for the Federation of Metro Tenants Organizations right here in Toronto, uh, to give some comments on her perspective. Hey, hi. So, yes, I am uh, Eurydice. I work for the Federation of Metro Tenants. Um, I would like to just make clear that... Uh, I'm talking here uh, as a friend of socialist action and not uh, as the, the tenant worker, although I can use my knowledge, and but uh, I'm not speaking for the Federation of Metro Tenants. I'm speaking here for myself. And I have to say that because um, that could put my job in jeopardy if I were talking for the Federation without uh, without asking them for that. So, uh, yeah, uh, there is a lot of things happening uh, in this COVID moment. And one of them is that the landlords are out there to get your serve. What is ridiculous? You know, they, uh, we have been receiving letters from tenants. Tenants have brought us letters of all kinds of landlords from the, from the, the more gentle to the to the more aggressive, saying you got your survey, we went our rent. Uh, don't come saying that you cannot pay because we know that you got you got your survey. And uh, the way landlords are doing it is by uh, talking to tenants one by one. So that thing that Rob said, if you do it on yourself you might not be very successful. Uh, you really want to do it with others. Uh, when you, all, all and lords are, are trying to do this. We do not talk to the network uh, of tenants. We do not talk to the tenant association. We are only talking to individual tenants for privacy reasons. This is not about privacy reasons. This is the fact that if they talk with us one by one, they can analyze our case. And, and we are weak when we go and talk alone with them. So that's something that you, uh, you want to avoid in any kind of a request to your landlord uh, to uh, defer or relief or rent strike. You don't do it on your own. You don't go alone. You do it with your neighbors. Now, who is going to be able to, to do a, a good paint strike? I, I don't know. Um, I, I heard the stories of Parkdale. I, um, I live with them because they're from my time. And uh, I think that uh, landlords learned no they were they were caught by surprise on the first uh, rent strikes the met cap one the second the no, no sport one and then they learned some stuff and when they did they become they become a little bit uh, uh, harder and they uh, they understood that uh, they if they used their lawyers against the tenants they had something um, 
In the case of the tenants from Lasport, uh, actually, uh, sometime after that, it was public in the newspapers that the tenants that lived there and had been leaders in that campaign were being persecuted by the landlord who was trying to evict them and pin some bad acts on them. And um, eventually we had another strike in Hamilton, uh, a big strike in Hamilton. And that, and that also got to a point when it, uh, it became impossible for the tenants because the landlords then uh, brought it legal and brought big lawyers and big shots. So uh, I don't know if the I don't know if the tenant strike is the best thing to do. I think that tenants getting together and being organized and and discussing it between them is the best thing to do. And eventually, if they are strong enough to to hold uh, a rent strike, they should do it. Um, this year, on the COVID, the way it started, um, I didn't feel much of an appetite. Uh, we were trying to get uh, tenant associations and networks to go and, uh, and push government. We, we did get a petition um, uh, a letter, like a lot of people signed. I never seen so many people signing in Toronto. Um, to government and landlords and stuff. Uh, but in the end, 85% uh, of people in Ontario just paid the rent. Uh, so I think we need we need a lot of organizing uh, on, the, on the tenants front. I need that somebody tell me when I'm talking too much because I'm not controlling my time here. I know that I have about five minutes. So uh, somebody tells me when I am there. Yep, it's been about five minutes. Those are very excellent comments, uh, Eurydice. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, go now to Ellen Ramsey, if you're there, Ellen. Uh, Ellen is a socialist action member and housing activist in Vancouver. Go ahead, Ellen. Right, thank you very much. I'd like to talk, um, I thank you very much to the previous two presenters, very wise comments. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you just fine. Okay, um, I wanted to talk about the current political situation here in BC. Um, as people may be aware, in 2017, the NDP was elected into government and um, they came in on promises to do things for renters, some of which they did. They eliminated the one-year leases that were ubiquitous here in uh, BC, um, that were being used by landlords to be exempt from rent control. And they also changed the rental formula so that instead of being the cost of living plus 2%, they dropped the 2% so that the legal rent increase can only be the cost of living. These were two reforms that the NDP brought in um, that affected renters and were very important. But there was a movement from below. When you have a rent and a housing crisis, a movement from below em emerges. And we've, done, we've been very successful in getting housing to be recognized as a human right. People are talking about it in those terms now. But what is amazing is that this crisis, this COVID crisis, has spearheaded more reforms than we would imagine could have been possible. So for instance, our BC government has made no rent increases to be made during the state of emergency period. Um, they've also put an end to evictions, except under some exceptional circumstances, to last during the state of emergency period. And they've also introduced the BC Temporary Rental Supplement Program, which is um, a supplement paid to landlords for $300 to $500 a month for tenants who have been affected by the COVID crisis. Now, the, the, the point here is 
Um, we don't know what's going to happen after the state of emergency has ended. Will the BC government give rent forgiveness for people who haven't paid their rent or will evictions begin? Um, these are all uh, thoughts uppermost in people's minds. As socialists, I believe that we promote public ownership of housing and put housing under tenant control. Um, and our governments have backed out on building public housing for decades now. And the question is, how do we get them back on the agenda? How do we get them back into public housing? Uh, we here have an NDP government that we can petition to for um, rent waivers and other uh, reforms. And we have an election in 2021 to use for pressure. But those of you who are in Ontario have um, a conservative city council and a conservative provincial government. And I'm just wondering, without a sympathetic government, how are you going to protect vulnerable renters and how will you be able to change laws governing the, um, the rental situation? Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. That was great. Okay, so last but not least, why don't we go to uh, Peter DeGama, who's here with me in Toronto. He's also an ACORN member and a Socialist Action member. Go ahead, Peter. Peter, unmute your mic. Oh, uh, sir. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Rob. And uh, you really see, and Rob touched on, on many of the issues uh, regarding landlord tenants rights. So I won't go over, over that. But I just want to make one point. Uh, the landlord tenant struggle underlying that is, is, is a class struggle. It's a struggle between workers and capitalists. And capitalism, the way capitalism is structured, particularly is uh, the capitalists try to extract surplus value from the workers. The workers in, uh, get a wage, which is just sufficient for them to feed, house, educate, and, uh, and, and, clothe, and clothe themselves. So, so enough, enough to keep them healthy in uh, power so that the labor power can be used by the capitalists uh, ongoing to extract surplus value. And uh, so the, the, the profits derived from, 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 uh, from, from, from the system okay, uh, is used for reinvestment back into the capitalist system, but some capitalists put, put it to other uses. They put it uh, to buy uh, luxury, luxury property, luxury housing, and or they put it in, in the banks, and the banks use that to lend out, to, to lend out to, uh, for people who, who, who speculate in land and, and property. And, and that, that, that's the basis of, 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 of uh, how, how we get uh, the, how the problems arose, and particularly in Toronto, the issue of gentrification. Uh, there, there's a vast, uh, uh, the, uh, the capitalist, uh, as everyone, uh, uh, enjoys a vast advantage o over the working class. And, and since the value of residential property depends on, on, the, uh, on the value on ground rent, urban uh, house owners always try to uh, make their property more attractive. And, and the one way of doing this is to have like uh, bigger houses near them in, in the city so that the value of their property goes up. And this, uh, when a house is torn down, a big house is, uh, goes up, uh, working class neighborhoods are, are destroyed. And the value of uh, uh, rents go up and they're pushed out. Uh, pushed out in the outreaches uh, of, of the, uh, urban areas uh, to the peripheries, and so um, and uh, I, I'm also a member of Acorn and uh, and, and in the Etobuk chapter in uh, uh, Northwest Toronto, and we see this, uh, we see this, and we, uh, see the the housing. Acorn has won some significant gains. They were uh, for, uh, they uh, they won. The uh, eviction moratorium. They were one of the people that uh, forced the government to put an eviction mor moratorium. Uh, at municipal level, they want municipal licensing standards, uh, which meant mean that pro certain property, basic property standards, had to be met, uh, met by the landlord maintenance standards. 
and uh, they and also they uh, they met uh, they are lobbying for more affordable housing increasing the the definition of what is affordable and uh, making more uh, more por a great portion of development affordable housing so but, but uh, these are struggles but we we should join them the landlord tenant is one struggle but, but we have to uh, also join in the uh, the other struggle the class struggle and in this in the air, air uh, in the air covid 19 we have to join with precarious workers uh, grocery workers um, uh, stri uh, striking for uh, hazard pay striking for increased wages for fair, for the right to unionize and uh, the right to earn a living wage in a city like Toronto because the more uh, higher wages you earn and if you belong to a union uh, you get higher wages uh, the more likelihood that you be able to afford uh, better uh, better uh, uh, housing and uh, more able you are to pay your rent so I, I think uh, Rob touched on the park deal strike, and I think keep if you go on that site, you, um, keep it on. They have uh, 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 another sister uh, site. It's called Landlords of Toronto, and there you see some of the big landlords that uh, Rob mentioned: uh, Metcap, uh, Starlight, uh, Capriot. Uh, they, they're all there. Okay, and what what they do? Is they they have financialized and securitized in much the same way uh, residential housing uh, was done by the banks and that led to the collapse, uh, the housing crisis in two thousand eight. Uh, they're doing this with uh, residential apartment property, and, and they're the marketing marketing in uh, uh, portfolios of uh, different apartment properties. You can check on their website, and they have you can see the. the uh, and many of these, uh, they're tied together. Uh, some of them are the owners, but some of them might be just uh, managers. And another, another uh, uh, company will be the owner. But uh, they, they are, they are trying to accumulate as as much property as Not possible. Either. And what they do, okay, just one more thing. Uh, they, in 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 uh, Etobicoke, they forcing the buying tenants out. Long, long term, who are paying uh, 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 modest rents and buying uh, buying them out, so that they imp increase the uh, they improve the property and then they increase the rents on on those properties, and that's the way they market their services and their portfolio. So it is a system also that we have to do. So uh, uh, more public housing, but also we have to nationalize the banks, the financial institutions. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. And thanks to all of our uh, discussants. That's so those are really enlightening comments. So right now I've only got one question and that's from Ellen. So Kurt, are there any questions from the chat that you can share with us? Uh, yes. Um, um, do you want me to ask them now? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to maybe get some more questions so that I can think about what I'm going to say. Okay. So we have um, several questions. So I'm going to start with one from very wise letter. Mm -hmm. If decent housing is a human right, why is most large-scale housing, apartment buildings, and big land developments privately owned? Homelessness is one of the consequences. So that's a question from Very Wise Letter. Okay. Um, Trixie McGoodwell asks, if you entered into a payment agreement, don't you legally have to honor it? And uh, actually, Sam Chidel, or in the chat, he's Sam Eric Dunk, resp uh, responded, yes. Um, he goes on to say that is, that is why it is not recommended to enter into repayment plan collective organizing with your neighbors, uh, uh, collectively organized with your neighbors. That's the solution that he, he puts forward. So uh, I pose those questions to you at this time. We have more questions. Yeah, let's so, just start uh, with that. Please. Okay, so how to protect versus conservatives? Well, it, it's not easy. Um, the conservatives, they're not stupid. Um, so right now they're not pushing too hard. Um, we, our wonderful uh, conservative premier, Doug Ford, has told people, if you have to buy food or pay your rent, you, if you can't do both, buy food. So the question of defending against the right wing is going to come later. Uh, when this is over, 
what are they going to do? Uh, are they going to make it much, much easier for the landlords to evict us? Because when this is over, um, the landlord tenant board was already backed up. They had no adjudicators and there was a backup. They were having a hard time evicting people because there was nobody to issue the eviction orders. Um, it's just going to get about two to three times worse after the pandemic. The danger with that is that the right wing might just say, well, you know, this system is broken. We need to make it really, really easy for uh, landlords to evict people. Let's just make the landlord tenant board a really fast process where you can get an eviction like that. If that happens, I don't know how we're going to deal with that. Uh, it is going to be something that is going to be absolutely huge. And as Ellen suggested, uh, the way to, to deal with it is to change laws. Yes, absolutely. Step one is, I guess, to vote in an NDP government. Failing that, it's a tough one. That is a tough question you asked, Ellen. Um, and uh, Barry asked, if decent housing is a human right, why is large-scale housing privately owned? Oh, that's simple. Uh, because the capitalist class does not recognize that decent housing is a human right. They don't recognize that as a right. Uh, they see them providing us housing as like a nice thing that they're doing for us. And we should be happy that we're not just living on the street. Um, so that is why you have private, large scale housing privately owned. Um, and short of a socialist revolution, it's going to stay that way. Uh, the only way for that uh, large scale housing to become publicly owned would be through a revolution or the other way, which may, might be a little bit easier, is for there to be a huge investment into uh, the construction of affordable housing, such as we see have seen in Venezuela, where they built 2.5 million units of high quality affordable housing, uh, which are available uh, to basically all of society. Another thing uh, that uh, affordable housing provides is the example of uh, Helsinki the city Helsinki in Finland, I think it's the capital, uh, they claim that they have eliminated homelessness. There is no homelessness in Helsinki. That may or may not be true, but what I do know to be true is that 15% of all people in Helsinki live in state-owned affordable housing. And finally, uh, Trixie asked, if you entered into a repayment agreement, does it make it... Yeah, it makes it harder later on. Uh, it's, it's essentially a contract. Uh, you've said, I agree to do this and this and this in order to keep my housing. And it's not, it makes it more difficult for you later on. It's not completely over for you. Um, you can go to the board and argue uh, your side of the story, but absolutely the landlord will bring that up. That will be their key piece of evidence that they will use against you. We have this repayment agreement right here. You said you were going to do this and this. You didn't do it. You're at the door. Um, so I would advise people not to enter into repayment agreements with your landlords at the time. Um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to say? Uh, uh, I can... Uh, uh, Rob mentioned uh, Helsinki, and uh, I just want to address Barry's question. Uh, I'd like to talk, and, and, I'd like uh, to um, answer Barry's question. Sure, okay. Peter, do you Hello? mind just letting yeah. uh, Ellen go? Hi, Ellen. And then we'll come back to Peter after. Go, Go ahead. ahead, Ellen. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I'd like to answer Barry's question. My understanding is that workers' housing springs up around the workplace. So traditionally, you know, going back 150 years or whatever, if there was a mine, then um, the the people the 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 factory owner would see that private housing went up in adjacent to the area where the mine was, and then the miners would work there. They would pay private rents and work in the mine. And that this is how housing has been traditionally organized under capitalism. We've got the strange situation in Vancouver that prior to COVID, there were actually jobs going that people couldn't wouldn't fill because the rents are so high in Vancouver that they couldn't afford to live anywhere near a workplace they were having to move way out to the suburbs and commuting became problematic so there was a shortage of workers in some um, service industries in Vancouver prior to COVID 
Um, what's interesting is that in terms of what the, N the NDP government have done and the municipality, all of a sudden they've started to deal with homelessness in, in so far as providing temporary housing. Um, they've provided 300 uh, hotels, community centers, and what we have have to ask is why wasn't this being done before? Why is it now we have a state of emergency? Suddenly the government is stepping in and starting to do something about the homelessness situation. This is something that we need to point out to all levels of government in Canada that we shouldn't have to wait till it comes to a health crisis like this to actually show our care about the homeless and do something for them. And of course, we're worried. These are temporary shelters. We're worried about the, in the long term what kind of accommodation will be provided for them. Thank you very much, Eurydice. Why don't we let Peter finish his comments? Uh, yeah, okay, so I'd like to address uh, Barry's question. Uh, um, why we have uh, uh, housing is the right, why, why is uh, private housing dominate in uh, in Canada? Uh, I think part of this thing, uh, part of the reason is we haven't had the political struggle around housing, tying housing uh, to a system uh, uh, that perpetuates private housing. That, that means, uh, like, we have to fight the capitalist system, the anti-capitalist system. To give you an example, the Russian Revolution happened in 1917. We know that they expropriated uh, 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 private uh, landlords, and but uh, the, the Russian Revolution uh, uh, gave rise to revolutions elsewhere and insurgencies elsewhere. One of these places was Vienna, and Red, uh, in, uh, Red Vienna at the local level. Uh, uh, there was a strong anti-capitalist movement, and they taxed the rich. They taxed the rich. They put rent controls, and 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 continued to build public housing. In in uh, they built, uh, I believe, in the first three years, uh, they built uh, uh, sixty-four thousand housing, uh, sixty-six thousand four hundred housing, uh, or a, a, a large number in, in, in a short period of time. Uh, one of these places is uh, Karl Marx uh, Court. If you go, if you've been to Vienna, you, or you can see it on, on the web, and they've continued ever since. Today, 60 to 62 percent of the housing stock is public housing, and there's strong rent controls, and nobody pays more than 27 percent of their uh, income towards rent. You, I mean, you can get a nice one bedroom for 350 dollars a month, and that's because they had this struggle. They tied it to the economic struggle. Uh, to the broader economic struggles, and they 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 they, they won that. And uh, Rob mentioned Helsinki. Helsinki has all. They also built a lot of public housing, and they have their own construction company also. So they they able to design, build, and plan uh, the public housing. They, they don't they don't have to rely on the private sector to uh, that much. And uh, if we had a similar commitment and we build more public housing, put stronger rent controls, the the uh, the, how the land price of land would go down because the private uh, uh, developers wouldn't build. It would be the public uh, companies that build. So we need to struggle. And one of the ways we can get that is if we organize at local level. And we uh, we at Social Society have tried to do this, tried to get the NDP to organize as a local party. And to uh, um, to advocate for this strongly in a common platform across the city. And that's. It. Thank you so much, Peter. Now I think we're going to get to hear from Eurydice. Um, all right. So uh, I just uh, just would like to put some things like in the general frame here. Uh, I live in Toronto um, for about twenty three or twenty four years. Uh, as long as I live here, this city has always had a problem uh, with uh, units for rent. It was always difficult for tenants. Uh, it's not different now. Uh, however, at this, this present moment, I think we have something else that is happening that is not only Toronto. There is a global, a global movement of... Uh, 
of the capitalists that work with uh, with uh, housing, they discovered this amazing thing that is the financialization of housing. And that means that uh, uh, they take the money from their drug dealings, for their shady business, for whatever it is, the money that they have to launder, and they put it into housing. And they build those condos everywhere in the world. They have those buildings that are either condos or rental buildings that are not used, are empty there. While people are struggling to get a place to live, those guys keep those those units empty to make it, uh, to, to bring value to that. So that's so much for housing as a human right. Uh, while those capitalists, those corporations, these very rich people are laundering their money on the places we have to live, we are not going to have a place to live. They are using it. And I don't know if anyone saw the movie Push. Uh, it's a movie uh, about uh, mostly about one co company called Blackstone and uh, what they do in terms of the financialization of housing. But in Toronto, we have our very own Blackstone that's called Achilles, a Swedish company that came here a few years ago. And uh, they just started what we now call renovation is a present uh, Toronto got from Achilles. All, all the other landlords learned fast, they are smart. So, and that is, you make your tenants' lives unbearable. So they move out, and when they move out, you increase the price. Our government, that is a conservative government, has no problems with it. Like, we have been advocating, there are, there are um, agencies and groups that have been advocating uh, for against above guideline increases in Toronto that have been advocating for uh, the va vacation uh, um, vacancy vacancy control. Uh, it means when you leave, your landlord cannot increase your rent as much as they want. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we elected uh, Doug Ford that as soon as we got rid of a provision, a provision that said you could not charge any price you wanted uh, as an increase for apartments after 1991, he said, well, but now you can charge after um, 2018. So those, I think that uh, uh, it is really important that uh, uh, we talk here about grassroots work we got to get tenants to get organized. We need that organization from the very, from the very bottom of this. Tenants in the buildings. Tenants in the buildings, the tenant associations, in tenant networks, bigger groups that interact with each other and can interact with those corporations. Because Toronto landlords are not... For a long time, they're not mom and pops landlords. Toronto landlords are huge corporations that want to treat you as a commodity or as a, a milk cow. So that's what it is. And I recommend uh, people to have a look later when you finish this conversation to a website called landlordsoftoronto.com and uh, just yes. learn it about uh, about who are the landlords of Toronto. I'll stop here because I think I'm already talking too much. So um, <laughs> there's more, I'll talk more later. That's great. We love to hear you talk, Eurydice. Okay, so Kurt, would now be a good time to go back to another round of questions? Yep. Uh, so we don't have that many questions, so I believe this will be our last round. Okay. So I'm going to start with a first uh, time uh, first time. Uh, someone who's asking a question for the first time. Uh, if Venezuela, uh, this is from Elizabeth Spice, and she's asked, if Venezuela, with all of its problems, can provide housing for the poor and homeless, why can't Canada do the same with all of its riches? Um, very wise letter. Asked. 
the, our states, the tenant strike can be a powerful organizing tool, especially if the, it leads to political demands for public ownership of the land development and construction industry and a works government to do it and a workers government to do it. Um, Sam Eric Dent says, uh, Achilles is relatively small, but their impact on housing practices by the big corps has been huge. Uh, Barry Wise letter uh, says, a revolutionary workers' party is not self-declared. It earns recognition as a vanguard party by putting itself at the heart of the workers' struggle, advancing united front tactics, socialist action. I believe what he means is one of them. And then Sam finishes, connection to the 1930s anti-eviction squad in the works, workers' self-defense unit blocks by block. Mm -hmm. So that's all of them if you want to make a... Yeah, I'll do my best with that. Uh, so why can't Canada be more like Venezuela? Well, listen to Justin Trudeau talk. Listen to Christia Freeland talk. Listen to the disinformation that uh, the heads of our government spew about Venezuela. Um, the ruling class in Canada is hostile to the idea of the working class uh, taking any kind of powers the way that they have attempted to do in Venezuela. Um, the government of Venezuela is very, very progressive, uh, almost revolutionary. Um, and the things that they're, the, the strides that they're making are phenomenal. And this puts fear into the hearts of um, capitalists in places like Canada and in the U.S. and Israel and everywhere else around the world. So that's why can't, Canada can't do the same. It's not that we can't do it. It's that we're not doing it. And that's because there's no will from the ruling class here to do it. And currently, the Canadian working class is not at the same level of struggle that the Venezuelan workers are. Hopefully, we'll get there soon. Uh, now, a tenant strike can lead to political demands. Absolutely. That would be nice. That would be great. Uh, through the course of struggle, uh, through the course of a rent strike, if uh, certain, if the most advanced elements can start to get, get class consciousness and start to see society for what it really is, which is a very confrontational class society where one class lives off the labor of another um, and start to make political demands to to change that that would be absolutely phenomenal i mean nothing that that would be like my fantasy um as far as achelius goes um achelius does have a big impact uh they're like sam said they're not that big but they are kind i they're some of the innovators uh in terms of how to rent evict um they, their whole attitude towards tenants is that they're they're almost like not human. Like they're like an object that you would move out of the way so that your assets can appreciate. Um, their tactics are unbelievably brutal. They're leaders in the field of rent eviction and own use evictions. And other landlords are learning a lot from them. Uh, Metcap actually took Achilles as their, uh, their mentor uh, to do all the things that provoked the rent strike uh, in Parkdale, which didn't work out so well for them in the end. Um, Barry also mentioned how um, leaders are not self-declared. They arise organically out of the working class. Uh, that's true. And I'd like to say that uh, I noticed that Parkdale Organize does not declare themselves the leader of any movement. Uh, they're there simply to help facilitate and help people organize themselves to improve their own situations. So they definitely are on the same page uh, as us on that. Uh, 1930s anti-eviction squads. Well, I was only born in 1976, uh, <laughs> so I don't know. I my my history is not that good. Uh, I don't know that much about what happened during uh, the Great Depression, uh, but I do know that this economic crisis is the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, and may end up being worse depending on how things go. Um, so, uh, maybe we could, uh, go to another discussant, uh, to see what they have to say. Uh, how about Peter? Do you have anything to say? Uh, yeah, just, uh, on a couple of issues, uh, uh, uh the, the issue, I, I think, uh, like Barry touches on it, um, that we need a united front on, on some of these issues. And, and I think one of the things we... We have to be supportive of the current struggles going on. We have, we have rent strikes. I think the rent strikes uh, can lead to political action, but we have to support uh, uh, 
and, and uh, support healthcare workers, uh, uh, precarious workers uh, also. It's, and we have to fight for, for $15 in fairness and, get, uh, and fight for living wage. And these things help build workers' confidence. And, and the more confidence they build, the more uh, they can take on uh, people like Metcap and Cap Capriot. And the other thing is we need to build a united struggle. Uh, uh, the issue is uh, if Venezuela can build 3 million uh, uh, homes, uh, why can't Canada? And uh, uh, as a member of SA, I'm proud to say that our comrade Barry did bring this up in it at City Hall and uh, forced my, Mike Layden to address this issue. And Mike Layden said he, he would. And I think one of the ways we can address this issue is uh, in an urban uh, uh, urban platform, we, uh, the NDP needs to form a local party, a coalition, or whatever it is, of, of different groups, uh, of which housing would be a major uh, issue, uh, and and push hard for, uh, for 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 housing. For example, the sidewalk labs uh, is gone now. They they uh, attempted to use public land for their own uh, private profit. But uh, we should insist now that that public land be used for housing, affordable housing, and uh, and any any other affordable land, whether it's owned provincially or federally, be used for affordable housing and be constructed by uh, by government owned or government led construction company and design company, uh, like they do in Helsinki, like they do in um, Vienna, Austria, and I, I think we need to build these movements uh, and. So, uh, and we need to uh, put these same demands on the NDP leaders provincially uh, uh, and federally also. I think um, that'd be a start to, uh, to build, uh, build a united front around housing and uh, employment. Thanks very much, Peter. Okay, um, Ellen, did you uh, have anything you wanted to add before we wrap up? Y yes, I, yes, I do. Yes, thank you very much. Um, but Peter's, uh, the, his list of demands, they're very, very um, pertinent. And uh, here in BC, apparently uh, roughly 60% of the population are renting. So we're a people's movement. And we have an election in probably 2021 or maybe before then. And we have an NDP minority government uh, governing in agreement with the Green Party. And I think we need to put our demands forward for tenant rights, for public housing, and um, uh, that there's a good potential to uh, see some reforms coming from that government and uh, hope that we can move towards um, a society of um, more That's equitable great, relations. That's great, Okay, and last but not least, uh, Eurydice, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, uh, just... Uh, just agreeing with you and the Venezuela Canada situation, what Venezuela ten has and uh, Brazil had once and Canada doesn't have in terms of uh, housing is political will. You gotta want to do it, and uh, that's not the way the the government of Canada takes it. Uh, about Achilles, Achilles is not small. It's a very large corporation that is spread in several countries. It is. In several countries in Europe, it's in Germany, it's in Britain, it's in Canada, and it is in Sweden. And uh, their effect has been very, very bad. Uh, in Toronto, their example, as you said, has been terrible. Uh, about uh, uh, what's going to happen, what, what's going to happen uh, once this, this pandemic is down and uh, and we have to pay, the ones of us that didn't pay our rent have to pay our rent. And our premier coming and saying, oh, you don't pay your rent, buy your food. I can only say that uh, the right here has populist stock uh, for the stocking by the side of his mouth. He, he's telling you that, but he's giving you no guarantee that if you don't pay your rent, you're gonna be saved. You, anything is going to come in your rescue once uh, you get uh, on, on the lines with the landlord and tenant board. Once you get there, what's going to happen? Uh, backlash, backlog is great, but how long it's going to last? Uh, I want to call attention in terms of evictions. They're still allowed. 
uh, if you commit an illegal act or if you put someone uh, someone's safety in um, in jeopardy. And landlords have tried to evict tenants here in Toronto. Uh, Using it, uh, apparently they weren't successful. Uh, the the LTB didn't buy it. Uh, finally, I'd like to make an observation, and I think it's a demand for tenants. Uh, Canada gives money. Every level of government in Canada give money to developers. Instead of building our own, we give money to developers. And uh, they do it and they put on conditions. And those conditions are like this. Oh, for 20 years, you're going to have affordable units. You know, this is no good. This is no good. What is happening is you have people that are 90 years old that moved into a place uh, 20 years ago and now they're losing their subsidy because that subsidy was just for 20 years. So, you know, government has to build. We need, we need to build housing. We do, we do not have to give our money, the money of our taxes to developers. I honestly, I want the developers to disappear <laughs> from Toronto, but definitely uh, this is not a way of doing that. And we should advocate for that. Um, yeah. Um, I think that is pretty much it. Um, one more thing. Uh, landlords can decide to change law to make things more difficult, but for that they, for tenants, but for that they need legislation and they need a majority. And uh, finally, for rent strikes, yeah, by all means, but we need to have all tenants wanting to go. And that hasn't happened. As, as of now, as I said, 85% of tenants paid the rent. So Canadians are very afraid of defying establishment in that way. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, Ellen Ramsey, Eurydice Baumgarten, and Peter DeGama, our discussants. As well, let's give thanks to our technical producer, Kurt Young in Mississauga. And especially thank everyone who tuned in tonight to listen and uh, who asked the questions in the chat. Now, if you enjoyed tonight's uh, broadcast, please consider buying a subscription to Socialist Action Newspaper. It's only $25 for one year, delivered right to your door. All you have to do is just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. That's www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would like to think about maybe joining us here at SA, just email us. Write to Socialist Action, sorry, Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at 647 986 1917. That number again, 647 986 1917. And once again, if you like the show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. Our next webcast is titled The Rise of Fascism in India. It's going to be on Sunday, May the 24th at 7 p.m. And Bill will be led by Mirage A with uh, Peter DeGama, Suzanne Weiss, and others. Also, uh, we have uh, our conference Socialism 2020 upcoming. It's an international education conference. It's going to be online. It'll start on Saturday, June the 6th with sessions at 4 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, the sessions will be Capitalism is the Virus, Pandemic, Climate Change, Economic Ruin, and Authoritarianism with international speakers from Italy, France, Canada, and the USA. And also The System in Crisis, a working class vision for the future with speakers Jeff Mackler, Emily Steers, Eve Engler, and John Clark. In the meantime, oh, and just before I sign off, I want to give uh, one website. It's going to be landlordsoftoronto.com landlordsoftoronto.com to get info about uh, the other side the landlord class uh, some good links there so you can learn about uh, the people who you're giving all your money to and for people interested in uh, rent strikes and tenant associations you can contact Eurydice uh, at Eurydice and I'll spell that Eurydice at torontotenants.org you spell Eurydice 
E U R I D I C E. You're ready to see at torontotenants.org. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay active. Bye for now.